Now that everybody's doing their research projects, this might feel a little bit more appropriate. Studies, you don't have to wash dishes for a living. If you study chemistry, you're still going to be washing dishes for a living for a while. Once you get to about your 30s, then usually you can have somebody else do the washing for you. But you're basically signing up for about a decade of being paid to wash dishes, just different dishes. Um, so today we're going to start looking at uh, organic chemistry. Uh, organic chemistry, it sounds a lot more echoey in here with so few people in here. Um, so we're going to start looking at at simple, what are called simple hydrocarbons. Um, and simple hydrocarbons basically just means that they're made entirely of hydrogen and carbon. Um, so you'd think that'd be a pretty small list of molecules since it's only two components. And it turns out that there are a lot of different ways that carbon atoms can combine. Um, so we'll start with a quick review of, of uh, Lewis dot structures. Who remembers how to do Lewis dot structures? So we're gonna we're gonna shift the focus. We're gonna remember how to do Lewis dot structures. Uh, and then we're going to, when we're doing organic chemistry, we do them a little bit differently. We shift the focus. Um, so here we're going to do some examples here. Here's our steps for doing a Lewis dot structure. Start by totaling up the number of valence electrons we need, or that we have. Um, and we're just looking at valence electrons. So we're going to arrange the atoms. We're going to pick, pick an atom and put it in the middle. And the atom we put in the middle, who remembers how we decide that? Well, it's the main one. The cooler one. The cooler one, the main one. The one that things attached to it. One that makes more bonds. Yeah. Those are all usually correct. Um, there's the most appropriate way you could say is the, is the least electronegative element. Because if you're putting it in the middle, it's going to be sharing more. Um, with the exception of hydrogen. Why not hydrogen? Why can't hydrogen go in the middle? It's one bond. Because it only makes one bond. So hydrogen will never go in the middle. So, and then once we, we just um, pick the center atom, we place the remaining atoms around it. And then we just start, we uh, attach everything. When we place those remaining atoms, usually we're going to start by attaching them um, by drawing a pair, by drawing a line. How many electrons are in that line? A single bond has how many electrons? Two. two. One line with two electrons. And so, what's the Lewis stop structure look like for water? <clears throat> that should be. But we have eight valence electrons where the other ones go. Fix on the oxygen. There's a total of eight valence electrons, right? There's oh, oxygen starts with six valence electrons, but then each hydrogen brings one valence electron too. So I don't I don't know how Carl teaches this, but the way I approach it is you take all the valence electrons and you put them all into one communal pile. And you divvy up the electrons as you see fit. Because then you're only keeping track of one number at a time, right? So what about CH4? How many valence electrons for CH4? How many from the carbon? Four. And then each hydrogen brings one. So it's another, it's a total of eight again, right? So carbon's gonna go in the middle because hydrogen can, right? We're gonna surround it by the hydrogens. And then just draw lines, draw our, our electrons. We use up all eight electrons. Does everything have a full valence? Yes. Yes. 
everything have a formal charge as close to zero as possible. Yeah. Those are our three criteria in order of importance when it comes to those dot structures. You have to use the right number of electrons to get it right because you can't just be making electrons up out of nothing, right? If you have the right number of electrons, the next most important thing to do is fill all valences. And last but not least, if you get a case where it's possible to fill all of the valences in more than one way, we have the way that you just, if you meet these first two criteria, it's a valid Lewis dot structure. It might not be the best Lewis dot structure unless we are also keep formal charge close to zero. So what's the formal charge on, on uh, how do we do formal charge? Who remembers? Yeah, basically we treat each bond like it's being split 50-50 between the two. And then we just kind of, okay, so if there's two electrons in this bond right here, well, it's a pair of electrons, but we can think of it like 50% of the time it's with the carbon and 50% of the time it's with the hydrogen. So it really counts on average, the carbon home owns one of those electrons. Some of the time it has two, some of the time it has none, but on average, it owns one. So it's like if you bought a snowblower to split with your, with your neighbor, how many snowblowers do you own? Half, really, right? Some of the time you have a whole snowblower and sometimes you have no snowblower. On average, you have half. So if we count all eight of these electrons around the carbon, all of them are in bonds. So carbon really only owns four of them, right? And how many valence electrons does carbon have on the periodic table? Valence electrons, four. So that gives the carbon a whole charge of zero. Started with four electrons on the periodic table, it still owns four electrons. About the hydrogens. What's their formal charge? How many do they own? One. How many do they have on the periodic table? So they also have a formal charge of zero because they have the same number of electrons they started. Uh, owned minus valence. Because if you get an extra electron, you just think about it in terms of how many electrons does it have. If it has an extra electron, it's got a negative charge when it's in this state. All right, let's do a trickier one. This is not really that much trickier. Let's do CO2 and then we'll do nitrate. I'm going to white out the screen again now so I have room to write. Mm -hmm. Should be. I did, I think I learned a new trick to hide this the menu. Yeah, it still says recording. That way it's not getting in the way. Um all right, so for CO2. How many valence electrons do we have? Six from each oxygen, right? So that's a total of 12. And another four from the carbon, 16. Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, it brings four, only the valence, no, that's thought, a trick one. I don't know why I was thinking 16 plus Two carbons too, obviously. Um, what's gonna go in the middle, carbon or oxygen? Carbon. carbon, less electronegative, more vacancies. No matter which way you slice it, carbon goes in the middle here. How do we divvy up the electrons? Evenly. 
We can start by putting one bond between each carbon and each oxygen. Double bonds. We'll figure out we need them later. Double bonds aren't as stable as single bonds. So we only make double bonds when we have to. So we just used four of our electrons. So we got 12 electrons left. We need to fill up your oxygens and your carbon. So six and six. So six electrons here, six okay. electrons here. That's all eight, they're all 16 of our electrons gone, right? But yeah, but oxygen only has six, so you need to take away, right? It's not. We're we're going there. Oh, okay. No, 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 you're you're right, and Mia, you're right too to say we're going to wind up making double bonds. But we always start from the outside and work our way in because the outside are the most electronegative ones, right? So if anybody gets first dibs on the electrons, it's the ones on the outside. And then we say, okay, well, we use the right number of electrons. That's our first criteria. Second criteria, though, was does everything have a full valence? Oxygens do, but the carbon doesn't. And so we can't just add more electrons here because we already used all of our electrons, right? So this is when we make double bonds. We make double bonds when we've already used up all of our electrons. We don't have any more electrons to distribute, but we still have an empty space around the carbon. So we erase a long pair and make a double bond. Is the carbon satisfied now? It still needs another pair of electrons, right? It's only got six, it needs to get to eight. How do we know which oxygen donates the next long pair? Well, the, the one that's more. Why? Because it. Well, you need to balance things. You don't make a triple bond. So you don't make a triple bond? Well, yeah, that too. That was balanced. That is balanced. But you're like, if you were to have dots, it would create like an imbalance and like a different. Kind of formula, right? Like, because the one on the right has too many. Oh, right. that's like a whole different. It's still CO two, so it has the right number of electrons. It's unstable. Why? It's less stable than the two bonds. Oh, the oxygen doesn't have anything. Because the electronegativity is, is like all screwed up, right? Um, our, our instinct is that it needs to be balanced, right? That it should be symmetrical. But we've got to be able to defend to decide which of these is the better option. They both meet our first two criteria. What was our third criteria? Formal charges. Formal charge. We want the formal charges as close to zero as possible. What's the formal charge? Let's look at the molecule on the right first. What's the formal charge on this carbon? How many did it own? Four. Four. And on the periodic table, it needs it has four, right? What about that oxygen? Seven. It owns seven, and how many on the periodic table? So it has one extra electron, right? Which gives it a minus one. This oxygen owns. Five, and on the periodic table it has six, so it's missing an electron, gives it a plus charge. What about on this side? Carbon still has four bonds, no lone pairs, right? So the bonds are arranged differently, but carbon still has a charge of zero, right? What about this oxygen? Owns how many? Six and on the periodic table, it has six. Formal charge is zero, right? And this one's the same, right? This is the argument for why this is the bright structure, not that. This one, everything has a formal charge of zero, which is more stable than having a plus one and a minus one. 
And so it's not just that it's symmetrical or that it looks better or it feels right or anything like that. It's always going to come down to the formal charge. And the reason it's worth going back and remembering how formal charge works is because we can, in organic chemistry, we take a different approach to these Lewis dot structures, where instead of counting owned electrons, comparing it to the periodic table, we can basically say, okay, well, if we just assume, unless we're, unless we're told otherwise, that everything has a full valence, we basically just go by counting how many bonds something has. In order for carbon to have a formal charge of zero, it has to make four bonds. Doesn't matter how they're arranged, carbon's got to have four bonds to get a formal charge of zero. So, in other words, for carbon to be stable, it has to make four bonds. Oxy for oxygen to be stable, how many bonds does it need? Two. Two. It's basically that's wrapping up Lewis dot structures and formal charge into one thing. If an oxygen has two bonds and a full valence, it has a formal charge of zero. So an oxygen with two bonds is stable. An oxygen with, with three bonds or an oxygen with one bond is less stable. So when we talk about organic chemistry, a lot of times we, we draw our structures that way. We just try to arrange things instead of just trying to, instead of trying to get formal charges closest to zero, we're doing that, but we kind of are, are doing it in a roundabout way. We just shift our frame of reference so that we're counting bonds instead of counting electrons. What about nitrogen? When nitrogen has a, it has a um, I guess let's look at nitrate. Let's clear this. Nitrate, NO3 minus one. How many valence electrons are we looking at? Oh, valence. Valence electrons. So nitrogen brings how many to the table? Five plus 18. Three times six. 23. Seven. Not quite. What else do we have? We have a negative charge. This would be the number of electrons if it was neutral. We have a negative charge, which means what? Oh, we have one more. One extra electron. Is this all coming back to you now? No. Not like, <laughs> tell me if it's not. I mean, I'm mainly laying the groundwork. I'm not actually going to have you draw those dot structures for these organic compounds, but knowing where they come from and where these structures come from is really helpful. So how do we arrange this so that everything has a full valence? What goes in the middle, nitrogen or oxygen? And why? Bingo. Hydrogen goes in the middle, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Is oxygen ever in the middle? In water? Why? <laughs> Besides water, um, when it's with chlorine, or when it's with when it's with hydrogens, but we'll learn that in the middle is kind of a relative distinction. You can have more than one central atom if you just shift your frame of reference, right? Every atom could be the central atom if you focused on it, right? All right. So, how many electrons did we use? To make those bonds? But this is the way that I like to do these is I just keep a running tally. Once I get a total number of electrons, every time I make a bond or draw a lone pair, I just subtract it and then and I keep going. How many electrons does each oxygen still need to get to eight? Okay. Each oxygen needs more electrons to get yeah. to a full base of three. Needs to gain an additional four. six. 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 Because there's there's two that it needs on each one. Right? Because that's because we're trying to build a base. 
So to get to do a total of eight electrons in this in the two of um, n equals two energy level, you need a total of eight. So if we if we add an extra six electrons to each of these oxygens, how many did we just add? Eighteen. We used all of our electrons. That's criteria one. We used the right number of electrons. Criteria two was fill all the valences. Did we meet criteria two yet? Oxygens are all good. Uh, nitrogen still needs another pair, right? We can't just draw a lone pair on it because we're out of electrons. So we make a double bond. Does it matter which of the oxygens I, I pull from? They're all symmetrical, right? So erase a lone pair. Add another bond. Now we've still used 24 total electrons. Sorry, I'm turning on the AC because it's 77 degrees in here, and that's that's not that's not okay. <laughs> um, I have a question. Yes. I mean, that's probably stupid. Nitrogen has four bonds, and that's that's right, right? Four bonds. How many? So, what is the formal charge on nitrogen? It's it's an acceptable answer because it fills the the, the um, valence for nitrogen. But how many electrons does does nitrogen own here? Four. And how many does it have on the periodic table? So it's got a formal charge of. Plus one, it's missing an electron compared to the periodic table, right? So it's not in its ideal state. That's what I was curious about. But it's better than having an incomplete valence shell. What's the formal charge on this oxygen? Zero. It's got two bonds. Two bonds, two lone pairs. Formal charge is zero up here. What about these two? These two are identical, right? Each one of them has seven electrons owned. The um, periodic table has six, right? So each one of them has an extra electron. Which means all your formal charges, and that's the next point I was gonna make, is your formal charges, if you do them right, have to add up to the overall charge on the molecule. Nitrite or nitrate is minus one charge. We've got a plus one, a minus one, and a minus one. Sums up to minus one. So if nitrogen with four bonds and no lone pairs is a plus one charge, when nitrogen is most stable, how many bonds is it going to have? Three bonds. Which makes sense. It's in, we knew we just figured out that oxygen with two bonds is stable, carbon with four bonds is stable, nitrogen smack between the oxygen and carbon, right? So three bonds for nitrogen. All right, last one on here. Let's do C two H six. C2H6, we can count up the valence electrons pretty easily, but then it gets a little bit wonky, right? So two times four electrons plus six times one electron. This is the total of 14. How do we decide what goes in the middle? Can't be hydrogen, so it's got to be carbon. How do we arrange everything else around it? Another carbon. <laughs> got to have another carbon. 
and then we just go hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. No. Why not? Oh, whoa. Carbon needs to not. Yeah, it cannot hold up. What's happening? <laughs> and it's stable with four bonds. So it's stable with four bonds. And not only that, things on the second row of the periodic table can never go above eight valence electrons. When you get to the third row of the periodic table, you've got an empty D orbital to play with. So you can occasionally wind up going with more than eight valence electrons on things like sulfur or chlorine. On things for the second row of the periodic table, you will never go more than eight electrons around it. So since we have a total of seven atoms, in addition to our carbon, we know they can't all be around this carbon. So what do we do? Put them around the other carbon. Put them around the other carbon. You know that each carbon is most stable when it's got four bonds, so let's give each carbon four bonds. Do we use the right number of electrons? Yeah. There's 14 there, we have, we have the right formula. Does everything have a full valence? Does everything have a formal charge of zero? Yes. Yeah, all the carbons have four bonds. Each hydrogen has one bond. Everything's satisfied. This gets back to the question that we were talking about before. How do we know which of these is the central carbon? The bow, depending on our frame of view, right? Which also applies, the next slide is a review of Vesper geometries. Vesper geometries, we looked at how many electron groups were around the central atom, right? So I have a question, like on the the carbon and the hydrogens. Mm -hmm. Are the forces between the carbons like different than the hydrogen forces? Like how they're getting like. Yeah, so there is carbon is slightly more electronegative than hydrogen. Yeah. It's still a, considered, excuse me, a nonpolar bond, but but barely because carbon pull, does pull the electrons a little bit tighter than the hydrogen does, you do get a slight amount. Remember that polar bonds versus nonpolar bonds, it really is a spectrum, not binary yes, no. And so carbon to hydrogen is considered a nonpolar bond, but anytime there's any difference in electronegativity on both sides of the bond, there's a slight pull to one side or the other. So yeah, there are different forces. They look different in terms of the ways we have of measuring these, these atoms. Um, you know, we can't just zoom in with the microscope because they're too small, but we do have ways of measuring the forces on those atoms, and that is different from the hydrogens to the carbons. A carbon-hydrogen bond has different properties than a carbon-carbon bond. All right, does this slide look familiar? Don't say that with a whole lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> That's okay. So the nice thing about these is if we can get the Lewis dot structure, these are really straightforward, right? So however many groups you have taking up space around an atom, it's going to determine what its electron geometry is. So I edited this, this one down so that it's just got the electron geometries. Um, what's the difference between electron geometry and a molecular geometry? Molecular geometry does not show the lone pairs, right? Correct. So one of those methods we have of actually looking at where these atoms are involves bouncing x-rays off of them. And x-rays, when they hit a nucleus, they bounce off. If there's no nucleus, we can't see anything there. But we see an empty space that tells us something's still taking ah. place. Exactly. We know it's there, but we can't see it. And so in this case, in the case of uh, water, it has four groups of electrons taking up space, right? So what's its electron geometry? Three. 
that one, the threaded needle. Yeah. But we can't see the lone pairs. Ooh, it's just right, and that's how we know that the, those electrons are still there taking up space because if there was no electrons and there's only two atoms here, it wouldn't be bent, it would be linear. Right, we know that those electrons have to be there, have to be taking up space because we can measure this in the lab by balancing x rays. You make a crystal, a water crystal, which is also known as ice. You can bounce x rays off of it. We can see that the angle here is about 105 degrees. If those, if it didn't have lone pairs taking up space, it would be 180 degrees. Right? So that's the difference between electron geometry and molecular geometry. In OCAM, we're mostly going to talk about electron geometry. So we don't really need to remember all the various um, other molecular geometries like tetrahedral, then there was trigonal pyramidal, and then there was bent. This one had trigonal planar and then bent. The trigonal bipyramidal had like seesaw followed by T-shaped followed by linear. Octahedral had a whole bunch of them as well. I remember doing all those. No. Right? So that starts sounding like the, like the teachers in, in Peanuts after a while. Um, the nice thing about organic chemistry is we're dealing with things only in the second row of the periodic table for the most part, which means we're limited to how many electrons around each atom? Four pairs. So eight, which means we're basically not going beyond tetrahedral in organic chemistry. Everything's going to be Tetrahedral, trigonal planar, or linear. Carbon is going to pretty much always be tetrahedral unless what? Unstable. Well, unless it's unstable. Lone, lone pair, maybe would like make it different. Carbon doesn't usually have lone pairs. Oh, yeah. It's got the formal charge of zero, but what could it have? What was the form? What was the structure of CO2 again? We decided not to go with the triple bond because the formal yeah, structure. Double bonds. Double bonds. Double bonds. How many groups of electrons are taking up space around the carbon now? Two groups. Two, right? Because yeah, there's two pairs there, but they're in the same physical location, so they're only taking up one space. And same on this side. So that even though there's a total of eight electrons around the carbon, it has four bonds, it only has two things taking up space. So when carbon gets, has double bonds, that can take it away from being tetrahedral. So what's, the, what's the geometry going to be for CO2? Linear. Linear. What about formaldehyde looks like this. What's the electron geometry on that carbon? Well, the carbon bends, but that is it bent? Well, not if it's mm, it's a triangle. It's the triangle one. It's asymmetric triangle. Right. Trigonal. Planar. 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 So remember, we're not going to those no. those bigger ones, right? All of our electron geometries for OCAM are going to be linear, trigonal, planar. Planar meaning flat or tetrahedral. We only get past it with that if we have elements from the third row or below on the periodic table. So the carbon is a trigonal planar here. And all of the bonds are going to be about 120 degrees from each other. They won't be exactly 120 degrees because the oxygen is bigger than the hydrogens. So it takes up more space. So instead of 120, these hydrogens might be 116 degrees from each other, but it'll be something close to 120 degrees. What's the electron geometry on the oxygen? 
How many groups of things are taking up space around the oxygen? Trees, three. Three, that's also trigonal planar. Right, so that's exactly what I mean. Each, each atom in a molecule could be considered the central atom, right? And it's going to have its own molecular geometry, which means really we're not limited to just building one central atom and a whole bunch of crap around it. We can build larger and larger molecules where we just start linking together. Here's a tetrahedral carbon, and next to it's another tetrahedral carbon, and next to that's another tetrahedral carbon. And so I remember I started this lecture out by talking about how hydrocarbons seems like it should be a really simple topic because it's just hydrogen and carbon. How complicated could it get? Well, that's like asking how complicated can Legos get? Oh, you only have two types of Legos. How complicated could it be? It depends on how many Legos you have and how patient you are in, in stringing them together, right? You could you know, make a statue of Michelangelo's La Pieta out of Lego if you wanted to. You can only use one type of Lego the whole time. It still looks really complex when you do that, right? And that's really the basis of organic chemistry. Is if, Yeah, it's all carbon-based, but if you link your carbons together in the right way, you can make a lot, a lot of different molecules. So let's practice switching our frame of reference. Instead of looking at a, at a formula and figuring out the Lewis dot structure, in organic chemistry, a lot of times we'll draw where the carbons are and just say, and the general assumption is there's enough hydrogens around so that every carbon has the right number of electrons. And it's, which means every carbon needs to have how many bonds? Four. It can have three bonds if it's got a charge, but it will never have five bonds. There is no faster way to put your OCHEM instructor in a bad mood than to draw a carbon with five bonds. Colloquially, that's known as a Texas carbon because everything's bigger in Texas. Um, and Texas carbons are bad. We don't like Texas carbons. We only want four bonds per carbon. So with that in mind, how many hydrogens do I need to draw around each of these carbs? How many hydrogens does this carbon need? So let's do one carbon at a time. Three. How many here? How many here? How many there? Here? For a total of 12. Three, five, six, nine, 12. What's the geometry of each of those carpets? Tetrahedral. 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 Carbon will always be tetrahedral unless there's a double bond. Oh. Right? Because when there's a double bond, that's when you wind up with it, have with two pairs of electrons taking up the same space. Diagonal. Trigonal planar. If you have two double bonds, so this is really, we draw it as a triple bond or think of it as a triple bond, but really it's a single bond and two other bonds on top of it. Um, so we call those different, you remember the term sigma bonds versus pi bonds? Yes. Remember not liking it perhaps? Okay. A triple bond is really a one sigma bond because the sigma bonds are the ones where your orbitals were able to overlap really nicely. A single bond always had a really good overlap between the, the orbitals. But the pi bonds go above and below. So they have this kind of weird shape. Remember we talked about the phases of these orbitals? You can wind up with these ones kind of like staring out to overlap. And they kind of make this, I've had a group of students, they called it vampire teeth or upside down canoes. Um, either way, we're, they kind of make this, this weird shape that's not as easy as just overlapping orbitals on top of each other, which is why double bonds aren't as stable as, sig as single bonds, because it's you get less orbital overlap when you have to use p orbitals to do it. When you can use the hybridized orbitals, you get really good overlap. 
So the, the blue one is a sigma bond, three player sigma. The red one is called a pi bond. So a triple bond is really one sigma bond and then two pi bonds. Um, which makes more sense now that we've defined that that nomenclature. I can say it properly because it really bothers me to call it a triple bond because it's really a sigma bond and two pi bonds. It's two different things at the same time. So for B, how many electron or how many hydrogens here? Three, three. one, two, three. Up there and here, three. No, it's okay. It's already got four bonds. And I guess just to finish this up, the formula for A would have been C4H. Oh, you do that? Like this? No, C5. That's what okay. I can count, I promise. We still have five carbons here. How many hydrogens, though? And how about for C? How many hydrogens for this first carbon? Just the one. How many for the second carbon? Zero. How many for this one? And how many for each of these two at the end? Three each. A huge amount of your first quarter of organic chemistry is can you count to four but not five? <laughs> right? Demonstrate that you can count to four but not five. It's harder than you would think. What's our final formula here? C5H8. C5H8. What's the, what is the, so these carbons on the end here, the CH3s, those are all still going to have tetrahedral shape, right? These carbons in the middle, what's their geometry going to be? Well, they're each going to have their own, but that carbon has, has three things taking up space, right? So trigonal planar. This carbon also has three things taking up space. So it's also trigonal planar. So the term molecular geometry is actually kind of a misnomer because molecular geometry implies the whole molecule, right? But that's not really true because every atom in a large molecule is going to have its own molecular geometry. And when you put them all together, you get an overall shape of the molecule. But you still have to know it's a tetrahedral carbon and a tetrahedral carbon and a tetrahedral carbon and a tetrahedral carbon. Or tetrahedral, triple planar, triple planar, tetrahedral, tetrahedral. Right? And that gives these things different shapes. So, real quick, before we take a break, we're talking about the different ways of drawing, drawing these molecules. Um, just so that you've seen all of the various ways of, uh, of doing this, what we've been drawing is called the complete structural formula. But as you can see, it gets really, it's really time consuming pretty quickly to draw all those hydrogens, right? So basically in organic chemistry, as soon as you've demonstrated to your instructor that you can count to four, but not five, they let you stop using the complete structure. Those first couple of weeks, it's gonna be a lot of drawing really sloppy hydrogens because you're in your homework and in your quizzes and everything, you're gonna be trying to go as fast as you can to draw something with 10 hydrogens in a row. Um, once you can do that though, and get the right number of bonds every time, we start being able to use these, these more convenient structures. 
Um, the condensed structural formula is it's still used pretty consistently, um, mainly because it's easier to type. If you don't want, if you're typing something up and you don't want to go and draw a figure on uh, some other software, copy and paste it into Excel, into Word, um, in order to show the actual structure, it can be a lot faster to just do the condensed structure, and especially going back to, to uh, printing press days. It was really, really hard to find a printing press that had like the right lines, the right characters to draw a lot of these um, these chemical formulas. So the condensed structural formula still conveys the same information, but in a way that you can type it, that you can set it with traditional fonts. Um, so you know it is condensed in that it takes up less space, and it's also a really convenient in some circumstances. If you're handwriting things though. Condensed structural formula is no better than anything else. It's barely better than complete structures, but it's way more than skeletal structure. So for a skeletal structure, we basically don't show the hydrogens. You show carbon-carbon bonds or carbons to other, other atoms, and then you just assume that everybody reading it has taken organic chemistry and can count to what? Four, but not five. Right, so this is the same molecule in all four of these. All three of those are propane. For this one, we're just leaving off the hydrogens. And the, so it's implied that you don't show another element that at the end of each bond is a carbon. If I wanted to show a different element, I could do it like that. So that... That just means there's three carbons. So that's three carbons. And if you did another one, it would be like that'd be four carbons. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And the rest of the hydrogens you just add on to make it so that everything has four bonds or the proper number of bonds. In this case, how many hydrogens would go on this first one? Three. On the second one? Two. On this carbon? Two. How many on the oxygen? Three. Or, oh, I guess it depends. Yeah, I'm to think so if we, if we don't have a charge on the oxygen in organic chemistry, we assume it has a full valence and the right number of bonds. So oxygen, when it had a full valence and the right number of bonds, it was two bonds and two lone pairs, right? So still tetrahedral, just with lone pairs here. So it looks bent instead. Right, but so this has all the same information as these others. It's just a lot faster to do that once you get the hang of it, especially when you start looking at bigger molecules. Skeletal structure looks you know, pretty wonky when you're just dealing with small things like propane. Even, even stranger, when you just have ethane, which is just two carbons, CH3, CH3. Skeletal structure for that is literally a line. But Nobody it, does that though, because that'd be too easy to confuse for something else, right? So with the really small molecules, condensed structure or even the complete structure winds up getting used more. Um, this one's kind of a combined, and, uh, it's a structural formula. It's similar to the condensed structure in the skeletal structure, kind of slapped on top of each other. Um, a, a lot of times you'll see this called the Kikuli structure. <laughs> it's spelled too. Um, after uh, German, I think there's an accent in there somewhere, but I don't remember if it's over the U or the E. <laughs> Probably a U. Um, who was one of the earliest organic chemists. He also was one of the first people to come up with a structure for benzene, which he got by by um, pilfering Egyptian mythology. You know, the story of the Ouroboro, the snake that swallows its own tail. It's endless. 
Um, he was reading Egyptian mythology and he came across that when he was trying to figure out the structure of benzene, which looks, the skeletal structure of benzene looks like this. And he, he realized that these, these pi electrons basically don't stay in between individual carbons. They act more like a ring, like the Ouroboro. It's the snake that swallows its own tail. Although he couldn't admit that he got something, he got inspiration from something as crass as, you know, African mythology. So he said it came to him in a dream. Um, and eventually it came out that in his journals, he had written that it's, he got his idea from Egyptian mythology. Um, but this is in the 1800s in, in uh, Europe. So, you know, the, the era of blatant overt racism um, was still alive and well at that point. So he, nobody, nobody really thought twice about, oh, well, of course he could cover that up. That was like a normal response from him. Anyway, fun facts about Kabuli aside. Um, methane. Methane. All right, let's look at this one and then we'll take our break. So the reason that this winds up being helpful is one, so CH4 obviously is a pretty compact way to write this. Um, doing the complete structure, it's helpful for understanding it. Showing it in three dimensions is even better while we're trying to wrap our head around these things, right? Because we might draw it like this, but really that's three tetrahedral carbons. And we're actually trying to draw it in a way where we show um, three-dimensional shape using dashes and wedges. Let's we get something that looked like this. And so the reason that that's helpful is, is partly to remind us this is not a, even though we might draw it as being a flat object, there's one, there's a reason why we don't draw it at 90 degrees, because these tetrahedral carbons are really 190 degrees. 190 is kind of hard to eyeball, so it's not a bad idea to just to draw it like you're drawing 120 degrees. Most of us know about what that angle looks like, or at least you will pretty quickly when we get into this. Um, but we don't draw it at 90 degrees, even though our complete structures, a lot of times we do. Just because if we've got a carbon with four bonds around it, it's convenient on a flat piece of paper to show it as being 90 degrees. But this is still tetrahedral. And, and so this overall molecule has its own shape. And it's constantly kind of rotating around and twisting as well. We'll get into that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but both of these are examples of what are called saturated hydrocarbons. So they're hydrocarbons because they're made up of just carbon and hydrogen, and they're saturated not with water, but they're with hydrogens. You have as many hydrogens as possible for that number of carbons. So you can't have more than four hydrogens for one carbon. What's the formula for propane? What's well, the formula for the one in betweens? It was C2H6, right? And then what's the, how can we predict based on the formula if it's saturated or not? Based on the number of hydrogens, what would the next one look like? We had CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, C4H10, right? So every time we add a carbon, we add two more hydrogens. But it's not, it's, so if I wanted to write a general formula, CN, how many hydrogens are there? Say it again. N plus two. That one works. Not quite. What did 
did you say? Was it was it you to me that said every time we add a carbon, what do we do? That would imply it's two n plus two. How does that work? It fits, right? No, because you're taking the n, so it would be like two times two for plus two equals six. Correct. Those extra plus two come from the carbons that are at the end. The carbons at the end of the chain aren't CH2s, they're CH3s. So by being at the end of the carbon chain, they get one extra hydrogen. So if you think about CH3, CH3, going to CH3, CH2, CH3, versus CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. Every time we add another carbon, it's like we're sticking it in the middle of the chain. We're extending the chain. Right, but at the end of the chain, we have these CH3s. That's where the extra plus two comes from. And so anything that meets that structural criteria or that, that molecular formula, CN H two N plus two is a saturated hydrocarbon. Every time you add a pi bond, we added a pi bond between between the two carbons here. Now, how many hydrogens does each carbon get? Two. Just two, right? Makes our, our molecular formula C2H4. That no longer fits this formula, right? Every time you add another bond between carbons, you're taking away a pair of hydrogens. Right? Because this pi bond, if you think of this pi bond when it was saturated, this pi bond was a CH bond here and a CH bond here. We took those two away to make the pi bond. So every two, for every two hydrogens that are missing from this formula, you know you have another carbon carbon bond, which can either mean you added a pi bonds or you made a ring. Because adding, making it into a ring means it's not a chain anymore, right? It's a circle, which means you don't have the end anymore. You lost those two CH3s at the end. Now you have all CH2s. But the uh, effect is you added a carbon carbon bond and it costs you two hydrogens. So that winds up being a really useful way of figuring out what possible structures you could have. Like, okay, well, I know I have, it's not saturated. I know I have at least one pi bond or one ring because I'm missing one pair of hydrogens. And we'll come back to that. You'll see why, why that winds up being important in 10 minutes. Let's come back at 10 after. This what they all I'm going to read up to the and then I'm going to do the
and really just using that to lay the groundwork for why carbon wants four bonds and oxygen wants two, and going back to geometries. Yeah. Um, since it's been you know three months since most of us thought about that stuff, right? Right. So perfect. Thank you, Sean. No I looked at you. Hey, it's just like, yeah, for sure. I'm sure it's really fun. Seems like, yeah, just like keep bleeding in the lower pocket. Right? Sorry, never, never ending. <laughs> Submission of some kind, like you had to send that in. Yeah, okay. I, think this, I sent it in like immediately after to the like, Yeah. The dude right then? Okay. So she, uh, she actually gives us like a oh, more than a week. I thought it was just a week, but it's like a little bit more than a week. My grace period, if we don't get it very done on the actual due date. So that's kind of why I was like checking with her because I, I could redo it if I needed to. Um, that's kind of why I was asking. But she's like, no, you're not going to do it. You're like, oh, yeah. I mean, this is not necessarily, this is just like, um, it's, one of, it's one of the few assignments that you get graded on. So I think you get like a lot of grade, especially if you're in the middle of grade. Like, like, it's gotta be too Yeah, basically. In a class like this, I'm like, okay, I'm, you get like this really great to like, what happened here? Yeah. I had a. Oh, it was so bad. Not that hard. <laughs> that makes me think of the, like a Russian history class I had to do for a complete degree, but it was obviously not related to what I was focusing on. Right. I had a group final project, yeah. and there was like a kid in the group who was getting dragon ass. And I remember I was just kind of like, I like had to basically yell at him. And I was just like, you're going to fuck up my grade, yeah. you cat. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm getting a fucking A in this class. Yeah. Do your part. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't care, but I care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's generally it's like actually yeah. <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I forget what era it is in the field like the fifties or something, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if him got me both in the fifties.
A homolog means that it has similar properties to other molecules in that in that category. Um, like we're seeing, there's there's so many different ways you can connect the same pieces when we're talking about hydrocarbons, um, and especially as soon as we start introducing oxygens or nitrogens into this, um, we basically don't memorize. Oh, methane has these reactions. Ethane has these reactions. Propane has these reactions. We take the whole class of molecules and say alkanes is the class of molecules. Alkanes go through these reactions so that you don't have to try and memorize every single molecule that qualifies as an alkane. Every alkane will go through the same class of, classes of reactions and have the same general outcome at the end. Um, and so that's what we mean by the term uh, homologs, mean that they're in the same category, they're the same family of molecules. And basically the simplest one, the simplest hydrocarbons we've been talking about so far, if it's a saturated, or if it's a hydrocarbon with no pi bonds, then we call it an alkane. And which, for some reason, uh, and then you put that here, um, is the, the title of the, of the slide here, alkanes. And basically, anytime you've got something in this category, its name is going to end with a. And so we just have a set of, of numerical prefixes, basically, that we throw in front of that. So the base, the base word that we're starting from for all of these is ane. So methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, and so on. They're all the same category of molecules. They're all alkanes. They're all homologous to each other. And that means that they'll go through similar through similar reactions. So, however, we still need a way to name them separately because just because ethane and propane are close to the same molecule, they're not the same molecule. There are some subtle differences that will produce different products. So we still need a way to name these. And like with all chemical nomenclature, um, the the goal is to be unambiguous so that somebody who reads that name could draw, will draw the correct structure with no misinterpretations. So we'll see here in a second. When we start looking at these larger molecules, this, the molecular formula is not enough on its own to get the right structure every time. So for starters, for propane, C3H8, practice drawing the complete, the condensed, and the skeletal structure. Uh, that's one we've already done. But remind yourself what these terms mean. Complete means every bond, right? So every carbon needs a total of four. And usually with these organic compounds, the simplest way to do it is just make them in a straight line. Put all your carbons in a straight line and then fill them up with hydrogens around. The condensed structure then, if we took this and we condensed it, it'd be what? CH3. CH3. Followed by? CH2. CH2. Then another CH3. Then the skeletal structure we already saw, we drew it like this, but that works just as well, right? These are three-dimensional objects that can be moving in any in all three dimensions, right? So we don't have to go left to right. It's just convenient if you're working on binder paper, since we read left to right, it kind of makes sense to keep it horizontal that way. But you can do it like that, you can do it sideways, doesn't really matter. They all mean the same thing. How about C4H10? Well, the easiest way to, to do the, the complete structure, take the one we just did, and we're just gonna stick another CH3 on the end. Erase one of the hydrogens, add another CH3. 
Is that the only structure we could draw though? What else would work? Well, we, if we add a double bond, it's not going to be C4H10 anymore, right? But we, we took this CH3 and we tacked it on over here to get us four carbons in a row, right? What if we attached it there, though? Is that still C4H10? Still four carbons. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's that's what I mean about sometimes the formulas can be ambiguous. Where C4H10 could mean this molecule, but it could also mean when we started with. That's also C4H10. But because they're different molecules, you need different names to be able to distinguish between them. So organic nomenclature is, is a, a whole subtopic. We, we did inorganic nomenclature in this class, right? We did acids and ionic compounds and simple covalent compounds, like you know, nitrogen trioxide and things like that. Organic nomenclature is a lot more subtle because even though we're dealing with fewer types of atoms, they're more, you can be more creative with how they're attached and our names need to reflect that. So let me go back. Here's our number one rule. Alkanes are named according to the longest continuous chain of carpets which means not named according to the total number of carbons, the longest continuous string of carbons. So our longest continuous string of carbons here is four, because all of our carbons are directly attached to each other, right? If I drew the skeletal structure, it would look like that, one, two, three, four. What's our longest continuous chain of carbons here? Three, right? Because if you start at one end, count one, two, three, you can't jump over here because then it's not continuous. The longest chain that's in a straight line, although we can twist it around so it doesn't look like it's in a straight line. So we have to be careful with how we look at this, but for instance, I could draw this molecule. That's the same molecule, right? Just twist it around a little bit. And as we get larger and larger molecules, there's more ways you can twist them around. But if you start counting at one end, it's still one, two, three, four. It's still four in a row. So that means that we're gonna use the root, the numerical prefix that means four for this molecule. But to avoid confusion with the Greek prefixes that we've already learned, we have a whole nother set of numerical prefixes. OCHEM gets their own numerical prefixes, so we're not using mono, di, tri. We're using meth, eth, pro, but, and then they get to be the same as the Greek ones once you get past four. And so that means this molecule, four continuous carbons in a row, we use the root butte, and then to say that it's an alkane, that it's saturated, we write ane, butane. It's four continuous carbons in a row. This molecule also has four carbons, but because they're not in one straight line, our longest continuous chain is three. So we use the numerical prefix pro, and then stick ane on the end. Propane, except that it's not just propane because propane didn't have this extra group hanging off the side, right? Propane would just be three carbons in a row, like this one. So we basically start from what we refer to as a parent molecule, 
the parent molecule is propane, and then we add prefixes to it to basically adapt it. So the numerical, we have a, what we consider as a branch. If this is our primary carbon chain, we have a branch sticking off. Think of this like the trunk of the tree, and then there's a branch sticking off the trunk of the tree. That branch is one carbon. So we use the prefix for one, the organic prefix for one, to just say methyl propane. So methyl propane is propane with an extra carbon attached in the middle. If we said methyl butane, we would be adding one carbon to the middle. It's still going to be four is our lone continuous carbon chain, but now we have a branch added. If we if we have two of the same branch, so what's our longest continuous carbon chain here? Still four. Yes. Two. But we have, and then we have two branches. Each of the branches is how long? Just one carbon, right? one extra carbon sticking out from our trunk. So this is a methyl group. And this is a methyl group. Would that be like a dimethyl then? Bingo. Oh. That's where the Greek prefixes come in. The reason we add another set of prefixes is so that we can say dimethyl. So this would be dimethyl butane. Is we need our our names to be unambiguous, right? Is there another way we could have dimethyl butane? Ah, oh. if you like flip where like the methyl groups are, like maybe like they do, or actually, could you put it on the ends? Could you what? Put it on the ends instead. Yeah, let's look at it. So there's our there's our butane. If we stuck another metal on the end, that just gives us a long chain, right? Yeah. Now it's pentane instead of butane. No. So not like that. I was thinking you could probably switch like where the methyl groups are. Could you like stick one of the chains onto the methyls? So like, no, like, like that? that? Yeah. Like that. Oh, Wouldn't that change yeah. the pre? What about our longest continuous carbon chain now though? Oh yeah. Now our longest continuous carbon chain is five. So this is one of the cases where skeletal structure actually might make things trickier. So let's, let me put it. Um, so I'm not gonna draw in all the hydrogens for the sake of saving time right now. The first one we drew looked like this, right? Is there another way I could attach those two methyl groups? What if they were both attached to the same carbon? There's a hydrogen there, right? What if we switch this hydrogen with that methyl group? So we have. So why is it necessary just because you can do that? Like Those are two different molecules. Okay. And because they're two different molecules, they're going to have two different melting points and two different boiling points, and they're going to react differently. They're going to react, react similarly, but not identically. Carbons attached to carbons react differently than... Exactly. <laughs> but this is what we call a tertiary carbon, because it has three other carbons attached to it. That's a quaternary carbon because it has four other carbons attached to it. Quaternary carbons versus tertiary carbons versus secondary carbons versus the primary carbons all react a little bit different. They'll all go through similar reactions because they're all alkane carbons, but there's subtle differences. And that's why we wind up needing to differentiate between these two molecules. Bottom of what? 
knows our, our main, so we still have the parent molecule of butane. Each, we have, still have two branches. It's just that each branch is one carbon and they're on the same carbon. So we really still have a dimethyl. An ethyl group would be if we had a branch that was two carbons long. We'll talk about that one in a second. If this is dimethyl butane, and this is dimethyl butane, we're just going to add one more one more wrinkle to distinguish between them. And that's basically we just throw some numbers in front to say where the methyls are attached. So basically, you start counting from one end of the carbon of your parent molecule. And this is carbon one, that's carbon two, that's carbon three, that's carbon four. Or start counting over here. Does that matter yeah. which way? It does. <laughs> because we want to keep, basically, it's out of, it, it doesn't in terms of being unambiguous, but by convention, we want to keep the numbers as small as possible. So this one, regardless of which way we count, we've got a methyl group on carbon two and a methyl group on carbon three. So we say it's two to three dimethyl butane. This one, if we count from this side, it would be three three in dimethyl. But if we count from the other way, we can make it 2 2 dimethyl. And so 3 3 dimethyl butane is still unambiguous. You would still draw the exact same structure regardless. But again, out of convention, we try to keep the numbers as low as possible. So we would call this 2 2 dimethyl butane. Do we need to specify if it's just methyl butane? Do we need to specify where it is? If we add it here, it's two methyl butane, right? If we add it here, you just start counting three times. So let's erase that one. That would be or three methyl butane, but if you do two, two because, yeah. and this is why we try to keep the numbers as low as possible because it avoids that confusion. This is two methyl butane, and so is this is also two methyl butane. Because if, if you think about it, think about taking this molecule, it's a three dimensional object, right? Take it and flip it like a pancake. Now the methyls over here, they're the same molecule because all you had to do is twist it around to make it look this way. You couldn't do that for two for two three dimethyl versus two two dimethyl. You can't take this one and just twist it around to make it look like that. That's what makes it a different molecule. In order to make this molecule into that molecule, you would actually have to break a bond and move it over. Yeah. So then, methyl. Oh, uh, sorry, pentane. If you were to move the methyl group, would it be more important on that one since it's not going to be? Yes. It? So for methyl pentane, one, two, three, four, five. We could put there's two places we could put a methyl group, right? We could put a methyl group there, or we could put a methyl group there. Why can't you put it on the other one, the other notch? But you right could it would still be- and That would still be carbon two if you count it from the other direction. It would be the same. So it would be the same. So, and let me color code this. So for the blue group, that would be two methyl pentane. For the purple one, that'd be three methyl pentane. That would also be two methyl pentane. If I had both of those, now what would it be? Four. Now we get to use the four because it doesn't matter which end we start counting from. It's the second carbon and then the fourth carbon. Two four dimethyl pentane versus 
to more dilemmal thinking. And so if you follow those rules, find your longest continuous carbon chain and circle it. And anything that sticks out from the circle is a branch. We just name those branches by adding prefixes and specifying where they are if necessary. And it's not always necessary. Look at look at methylpropane. Is there any other place you could put a methyl group? No, because no, there's only one interior carbon, right? If you added a methyl group here, you just, you didn't make methylpropane, you just made butane instead. Right? And same with butane. If it's just one methyl group, that's two methyl butane, no matter which way you look at it, right? So technically you don't need to say two methyl butane. Methyl butane is two methyl butane by definition. It's never, it's a little bit redundant to say two methyl butane, but it's not something where, where you're incorrect, you're being overly correct, which is usually better than being under correct, right? I suppose. It's one of those things where it might, if you said two methyl butane to an organic chemist, they might tilt their head a little bit, but they're not going to correct you unless they're, unless you're, you're an instructor. Um, but in passing, like everybody knows two methyl butane is methyl butane. All right. And just as a reminder, here's the, here's the organic root molecules or root names. Um, basically from, from five on, they're the same as the, as the Greek ones. Those ones wind up being used less. And so there's less of an issue with, with using, um, very rarely are you going to have a pentyl group attached to anything else, or let alone five of them. So, but technically you could have penta pentyl something. It would just be a really weird molecule, It'd be very unusual. For the most part, these first four are the only ones that are different. Meth means one, eth means two, prop means three, four mean, but means four. And then you just stick ain on the end to say that it's saturated. We just did those, so we'll skip forward. So this, those slides that I just skipped through are the, what we just worked through. So if you, if you want more explanation and you can focus, you can go through these. There's the 3D structure for butane and methylpropane. They have the same total molecular formula, but not the same name. They are different molecules. All right, so here's our steps naming branched alkanes. Find your longest continuous carbon chain. In this case, so going through the molecule at the bottom. Yeah, I generally I like to circle it because when you circle it, anything that sticks out from the circle is going to be a branch. So by circling it, that's your tree trunk. Anything sticks out from the tree trunk is a branch, and we're going to name those branches. So you name your parent molecule. So we have pentane. Add a prefix to indicate the size of the chain. So methyl pentane. And then, if necessary, describe where the side chain is located. So that this would be three methyl pentane. So because we have to have names for everything in, in sciences, there's actually a nerve name. This is a prefix. This actually has a name too. That's not technically a prefix. They call that the locant. The locant just tells you where something is. Maybe prefixes by definition need to be need to be made of letters, not not numbers. Um, either way, we have a different term for that. I just call it the number or say where it is. So if I give you a 3D structure, it looks a little bit more intimidating. 
the first thing you might need to do is redraw it in the in the skeletal structure or the uh, condensed structure. What is this? What's our longest continuous carbon chain? Uh, it's the three. Does it matter which three I circle? Uh, That's still three in a row with the methyl side chain, right? That's still three in a row with the methyl side chain. That's still three in a row with the methyl, methyl side chain. Find your longest continuous carbon chain. And if there are multiple that are the same length, pick one. What about here? What's our longest continuous carbon chain? Pentane, specifically two methyl pentane. And now remember, somebody asked me about why I kept putting hyphens in between everything last last week when we were doing the coordination compounds. Mm -hmm. It's a habit for teaching OCHEM. Okay. It's because technically, methyl pentane is supposed to be one word, and dimethyl pentane is all one word. And if you had methyl ethyl pentane, that would all be one word. Um, so it gets really, really hard to see where one prefix stops and the next one begins sometimes. So I, out of habit, I always put hyphens in between them. That's not the most technically correct way to do it, but I think it makes it a lot easier to read and see what's happening. It's our longest co continuous carbon chain here. Five again. So it's still pentane. It's not methyl. It's not methyl. What was this? Ethyl. The second one is ethyl. Where you methyl? This is one of those ones where technically you don't need the locant because if you put an ethyl group on carbon two, you actually get hexane. Uh -huh. Ooh, because of because you need the longest continuous carbon chain six instead of five. But again, it's not wrong to say three ethyl pentane to avoid that confusion. But if you had two ethyl pentane, you'd be have you would have that would be wrong, correct? So if it was two ethyl pentane, there's our pentane. There's our ethyl group. Now our longest continuous carbon chain is six. So two ethyl pentane is really three methyl hexane. Sydney. Are we have to learn the base names? Memorize yes. Okay. Only four of them. Did I love it, Chuck. What if they're more complicated? What's our longest continuous carbon chain here? Two, three, four, five. Five. We have two different chains. We have a methyl and we have an ethyl. So it's still pentane, it's still our parent molecule. So start by writing pentane. Two methyl, three ethyl. Two methyl, methyl. <laughs> And this is another case where, yeah, it's you don't need that locant, but it can be helpful to make sure that you break things up. So two methyl, three ethyl pentane. You just start <laughs> packing stuff on. You just make it as long as it needs to be. It is when you get the angle, it is it's, it's kind of the same. Very like you know, it's the same process over and over again, and you can make these really really long names that take up three lines of binder paper. <laughs> um, but it's the same process over and over and over again. So technically, yes, except I don't really get picky about that because there's disagreement between different organic chemistry textbooks whether if it was if it was dimethyl, whether that gets alphabetized under D or M. So I don't even get two methyl, three ethyl, or three ethyl, two methyl, you'll still draw the same mold. It's unambiguous either way. 
And so I don't care about that. Um, if you take an organic chemistry class from somebody who does, just do it the way they want it done. Um, I'm sure that there are those teachers out there. That's not me though. Um, if everything, if every textbook out there was consistent in how they said to do it, then I would make you do it that way, but there's a lack of agreement. So what about if we picked a different five in a row? What if we picked that as our longest continuous carbon chain? Still five, right? That's still pentane. But now we have a complicated branch. Our branch has a branch. So how do we name that? There's two approaches. There's the old school way, which involved memorizing more prefixes. ISO versus SEC versus TERT versus N versus, there's another one I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Um, the consistent way involves using parentheses the way that you use parentheses in math to say, do this first. So what's the longest continuous branch that starts from here? Sorry, that starts here. Two. two. Just those two is what I was looking for. I see what you're saying. But if, we, if the, the carbon that's directly attached to the tree trunk has to be carbon one of our branch. So that means there's two carbons in a row there, right? And then there's a one carbon branch on our branch. So the purple is pentane. And then the pentane has an ethyl group on carbon three. But then the ethyl group has a methyl group attached. So the way we're going to indicate that is to say it's a methyl ethyl in parentheses. Methyl ethyl means that your ethyl group has a methyl group. It's one. Of, it's definitely one of those things where if you start saying the words too many times, it starts having all meaning, and you need to take a break before anything makes sense again. So how do we know like which way to format it? Like, does it matter? Does if you can pick pick five in a row that doesn't involve a complicated branch, that's usually better. It's a simpler name, but technically, saying three methyl ethyl pentane is correct, and saying two methyl three ethyl pentane is also correct. Okay. When you get to the hang of using these parentheses, though, those are really easy to use, too, because you just say, okay, I'm ignoring the rest of this molecule. I'm just looking at this. I'm just doing what's inside the parentheses and call it my same process as normal. And then you close your parentheses, and now you're looking at the rest of the molecule. So we have a methyl ethyl group on a pentane. And wouldn't you want to format it so you have less of the... Um... The cocant number, like the lower cocant number. So, like we if you're. Would, this one, three out of pentane is as low as it can get. Yeah. But if you were to like, because different, you can do different names. You just want to get it, try to get the lower. Try to keep those numbers as low as possible. So, go back to the way we need it first. We said two methyl. Uh, three ethyl pentane. We could have counted from over there and made it three ethyl four methyl, but why would we do that? We want to keep the numbers as low as possible. So always check anytime you're doing putting these these numbers on there. Check that you can't just count from the other end to make it lower. If you start by circling your main carbon group, though, it should be pretty obvious. Like you have. You can start here or you can start there.
Oh, this one. Two methyl, two ethyl pentane. I don't know. It's a carbon chain is I clicked on the top. No. So if you start counting down here, you can get six in a row. Okay. So the skeletal structure for this one looks like. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't think that's the same. There's our longest continuous carbon chain is six. And it's got two methyl groups, both the have the same carbon. So it's going to be dimethyl. Close. You say dimethyl, you've got to specify what both of the methyls are. So it's not three dimethyl hexane, it's three, 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 three dimethyl. Try would mean that there were three methyl groups, not where they are. The numbers would tell us where they are. So three, three dimethyl hexane, as opposed to three, four dimethyl hexane or two, two, five dimethyl hexane. We're all going to have the same formulas, but are going to be different compounds. All right. So while this feels like a lot, a lot of nitpicking and a lot of rules for rules sake, so that we can be as extremely specific, and it doesn't feel like it's that concise, but it really is pretty concise way of doing this. Um, it means three three dimethyl hexane is about as few characters as you could have to indicate is something as complicated as this whole structure, right? So, and we're gonna continue on from there and add more wrinkles to it, but not today. So we'll go ahead and, well, and we're, yeah, we're right in time, perfect. And we'll start doing more practice with this and looking at more structures and more drawing things on Thursday. Texas has a really cool song to show you. Oh, yeah. The remake of yeah. Rob Zombie. It's Rob Zombie. Is that the bodies at the floor? That's a drowning pool. That's not. Oh, a drowning pool. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry.